Hey, good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Good. It's good to be with you guys in the house this morning. We're going to give some praise to the Lord together, so I want to invite you to stand to your feet. We're going to sing this new song, giving praise to the God of awakening, asking him to wake us up, awaken our eyes to what we see in him. I invite you to put your hands together as we sing this together to the God of awakening. Church is coming awake and we'll sing your praise. We're dancing out of our graves. We're throwing off every chain. Your church is coming awake and we'll sing your praise. We're dancing out of our graves. We're throwing off every chain. Your church is coming awake and we'll sing your praise. We're dancing out of our graves. We're throwing off every chain. Your church is coming awake and we'll see your praise. Dry bones will come back to life and they'll start dancing. Blind eyes will finally have sight and they'll start singing praise, 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 praise. And we're all singing praise, 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 praise. Foundry Church. We are so glad that you are here, whether you've been with us a million times or this is your first time. We are sure glad you're here to worship with us, either here or online. We want to welcome you and hope you feel welcome and the Spirit of the Lord moves in your hearts and in this place today. Um, Directly in front of you on your seats, you'll find a card that has both prayer requests on one side 
and a connect card where you can find out more about the life of our church. If you'll fill those out and turn them into our connection point, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to know how we can pray for you and how you can get plugged into the lifeblood of our church. Today, I'm excited as well because this is a baptism Sunday. We had a family at 915 that's joining, and I'm going to invite the Triola family to come up, and we have another baptism of Nora this morning. So, friends, baptism is an amazing thing. It is a sacrament of the church. It is a sacred act of of what we believe is really just an incorporation into the body of Christ and into this local church at Foundry. And so today, Nora is being baptized. How you doing, Nora? She's like, uh-uh, I don't want any of that. She hadn't had bath time yet. And so, friends, baptism is, is an outward expression of an inward working. And Nora will, um, will grow up in this church. She will hear about Jesus. She will... Um, she will hear about all the amazing things that Jesus has done in her life. And when the time comes, um, we're going to pray for her and encourage her um, in her walk with Christ as she takes that baptism on herself. And so today, her parents are here. We're going to baptize her. And then I'll ask you guys in a minute to also speak words of blessing over them. All right. So Nora, your mom is going to hold you. Sound good? <laughs> here we go. A little bit of cold water. Nora Triola, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Now, Mom and Dad, I'm going to invite you to come down front with me here. And so, friends, one of the things that we would like to do is we want you to also actively participate in speaking words of blessing and welcoming Nora into our family and household of faith. So if you will, just stand where you're at real quick. And I'd love for you to kind of reach out and stretch out your arms towards Nora and towards her family, the Triola family. And I'd love for you guys to speak some words, prophetic words of blessing over her today, whatever words come to mind. So let's start over here. What words do you guys have for Nora today? It can be love, peace, love, friendships, whatever, faith, Jesus, joy, grace, hope. How about you guys over on the left Favor side? Of Favor of God. Blessings. Blessings. Courage. Courage. Protection. Patience. Anyone else? Health. Health. Mom and Dad, do you have a word for Nora today? Love. Love. Amen. Friends, thank you. Let us pray. Lord, today we pray over Nora. We thank you for her life. Pray for mom and dad, Lord, that they would continue to be encouraged and surrounded by a family and a household of faith that loves and encourages Nora in her walk with you every day. We thank you, Lord, for what you have done with this household and continue to do. Walk with her each day of her life. Thank you for loving her in Jesus' name, amen. Friends, you may be seated. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Friends, there's a lot of wonderful things going on in the life of our church right now. I'm going to direct your attention to our screen so we, you can hear a little bit more about what's happening right now at Foundry Church. Hey, Foundry guys, I'm super excited because it's time for our second annual Cornhole Tournament at Foundry. This year, it's going to be at our Fry Road campus. And if you haven't ever played cornhole or you've played a million times and you're a grand champion, all levels and all ages of men are invited to come out and join us. It's going to be super fun. Uh, registration will be at foundrychurch.org slash men. And it's $25. 25 bucks will get you a catered meal and a drink, as well as enter you into our cornhole championship so dust off the bean bags and toss them towards the board and we'll see you guys there invite your neighbors and friends it's going to be a lot of fun we hope you'll join us it's summertime and that means one of our favorite concert traditions is coming up here at foundry we hope you'll join us on sunday july 2nd at 5 p.m for the houston symphonic band's patriotic concert featuring the foundry choir 
That's right, this event is free and open to the public and the community. So bring your family, your friends, your neighbors, your loved ones, and join us for a fantastic evening of music and fellowship. For more information, you can check out the events page on the Foundry website. See you there. Howdy, Foundry family. Are you ready to celebrate the second best birthday of all time? Only second to Jesus' birthday. It's America's birthday coming up. And we want y'all to purchase a brisket party pack for $125 for time for July 4th. All the proceeds will go to help support Cairo's prison ministry. A brisket party pack includes a fully smoked brisket, three eight inch hot links, and one loaf of white bread. Make sure to go to foundrychurch.org slash brisket. And you can pick those up June 30th so you can enjoy for America's birthday. Well, friends, you still have time to order that brisket. We hope you will. It does go to our amazing Kairos ministry, so please go and sign up for that today. And also for our cornhole tournament. Friends, today is the last day that we're gonna register for cornhole, so guys, please go and sign up. Tell other men about it. We're gonna move everything indoors here because we know that the heat is just sweltering. And so we'll have the cornhole tournament right in here and also eat our catered meal as well. So please go and sign up for that. We look forward to all you guys joining us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come and to worship you today. Lord, we pray that your presence will be among us so that we will leave this place different because we have encountered you today. Will you speak life into us, Lord? Will you touch our hearts? Will you do what only you can and change us from the inside out? It's in Jesus' name we pray today. Amen. Church, would you stand as we sing together, fixing our eyes upon the Lord, for he is where our hope and our salvation comes from and our strength, all wisdom comes from the Lord. So together we lift up our praises this morning and ask that they fall upon his ears be holy and acceptable to him. Let's sing these words together. God, I look to you. God, I look to you.
praise this morning for we can look to you when we're overwhelmed and we don't know what's coming next God and cast our cares and anxieties on you for you say that you will take them and you'll take us so we lift up these praises from the depths of our hearts and ask that they fall upon your ears and be a holy and acceptable sacrifice and offering to you this morning it's in your son's name that we offer this up today. Amen. Church, you guys can be seated. Take a look at the screen behind me. Well, hey, Foundry family, I just want to celebrate another great week of mission that our students were on this past week. Our high school students were serving in Southwest Florida and Fort Myers, and they made a difference in the lives of so many people there as they served. But what we know to be true is that their faith is grown. They are, are, the Lord does something amazing when our students serve. We've seen evidence of this and how it has lasting effect in their lives. And so thank you for praying for them. Uh, thank you for uh, continuing to be faithful in giving so that all of our students, all people of all ages can come into a deeper knowledge of God and his son, Jesus, and the work of the Holy Spirit and can grow as followers of Jesus and share the light of Christ with the world. We, that's our mission, to help people know, follow, and share Jesus. And when you give, you are helping make that mission a reality in our world. And, and so thank you for your continued support of the ministry of Foundry. You can give in many ways. If you're in person, you can give at the boxes at the exits. Or uh, no matter where you are, you can give by text, online, or by mail. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the many things that you are doing in our midst and the ways that you're blessing our world and leading more people to know, follow, and share Jesus uh, through the ministry of Foundry. I pray, Lord, that you would just bless those who, who give faithfully, that you would provide for all of our needs, that we might give even more faithfully to you. Lord, thank you for your blessing in our lives and the ways that we get to be a part of your good work. I pray, God, you'd bless the offering that we give, and uh, Lord, that you'd multiply it and use us uh, to make an even greater impact for your kingdom in the world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In church, as we continue in the spirit of prayer and worship, I want to tell you that we're going into a time of extended singing and time where you can offer up your praises and your worship to the Lord. And as Pastor Ray said in the video, one of those ways that you can offer that worship is by giving financially. We've gone through the ways that that can happen. We also have this prayer wall up at the front that you're always welcome to come right down and offer a prayer. We're also going to sing, so I'm going to ask you guys to stand to your feet so that we can declare these praises to the Lord together. And we'll sing these words. As the music fades and all is stripped away I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's over That will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song For a song is not what you Sorry, Lord, for the thing. 
nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you, nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Jesus. Nothing else. nothing better than you and there's nothing more than you that I need I can sit at your feet and be fully fulfilled because of your awesomeness and your wonder God you allow me to sit at your feet and I praise you for that caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet, caught up in this holy moment, and I never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, you don't owe me anything and more than anything that you can do. I just want you. Amen, church. You all can be seated. My name is Luis Plomo, Jones Road Campus Pastor, and it's great to be back here at Fry. I haven't been here in a while, because Andy ruined it all, so I don't, I don't get to come out and play a whole lot. No, seriously, it's, it's great to, to be in worship with you guys and be here with one of my good friends as well and, uh, and to share God's word. I'm wondering, have you all ever smelled something so bad that just made you want to like gag? Like something else, you know, something so bad you want somebody else to smell it because you want it verified? Like my brother once got something out of his mouth and then squeezed it. You're not supposed to squeeze it, but we were little. He's like, Junior, check this out. Like, like that whole smell, I won't begin to describe it. But our smells have a way of speaking to us. I remember when my sister um, was expecting her, her first child, I flew to New York to go see her. And when I got there, she gave me a big hug. She says, hey, Junior, could you do me a favor? And I said, yeah. She's like, could you take a shower and then whatever cologne you had, don't put it on because it makes me want to barf. So I, those of you that have been really sensitive with your sense of smell as you've been pregnant understand what that's like. Um, a few weeks ago during VBS at Jones Road, 
Um, we had a storm come through. It was after VBS and everything else. And we had somebody from our staff run into our sanctuary and go into the usher's closet. And it was dark. And as she opened the door, there was this foul smell that came out of there. And she said, what is that smell? And she reached in to grab the umbrella and at the same time turn on the light. And we had moved a couch in there. And there was someone laying down that decided to take a nap. At that point, she rushed back to the other building where I was sitting with Teresa, our executive pastor, and she said, I think somebody needs to go talk to this person. I was like, yeah, somebody should go talk to that person. Um, you know, she's executive pastor, so go be executive. So she, she did, and, and then I felt bad. Somebody stopped me, and then I went and joined her. So was she standing there, and the door is being held open, and I come around the corner, and as I peek my head in to see what's going on, and she's standing there just like a boss talking, having a conversation with this dude, I get this just this smell, it's just this stench comes in. On, and I just keep walking. I just kept walking. I went into the sanctuary, and it started filling up the space. And I looked down, and Guillermo was there cleaning up the sanctuary. And he looks at me, and he's like, hey, pastor, he walks over. And then I can see his face. His face can smell what I can smell, but his face thinks it's me. So at this point, I'm like, oh, no, no, I got to make it clear to him. I was like, no, no. I said, do you smell that? And he's like, mm-hmm. And I was like, no, no, it's a guy taking a nap in the closet. He's like, a guy taking a nap. Yeah, like I've, never, I've heard it all, but not this one before. And at this point, I walk past him. I go over to where we put the little boxes and we put our offerings. We have a little hand sanitizer still in there. And I walk over and I grab hand sanitizer and I do one of these because I, I needed it so badly. And then he's like, oh, he's not playing. So I went, I grabbed it, and I walk back in. I'm still doing one of these numbers, trying to back up. I'm a horrible backup for Teresa. And we end up um, helping this guy out and ultimately got him to Luby's where he needed to go. But the sense of smell has a way of connecting with us. If we don't like the smell, there's a high probability we are not going to touch it, much less eat it. And this happens when you walk into someone's house and they're cooking certain vegetables or spices. You're like, I just my body, I can't. Some of your faces are telling me, yeah, quit talking about this stuff. I get it. I remember one day I walked into the house after doing um, the lawn, and I walked over to her oldest son. I was going to give him a hug, no big deal. And as I got closer, he's like, you smell like a Mexican restaurant. And I was like, it's a Costa Rican restaurant, but we'll leave it at that. Our, our, our senses have a powerful way of allowing us, one of the, it's one of the primary ways in which we process and digest and understand the world around us. And our society has evolved in the way that we use our senses. Uh, we're very tactile in many ways. Back in the 19th century, museum goers would not only look at the things, smell the things, but they would actually go over and taste the things, touch things with their tongues, because it enhanced their tactile experience. So I, I encourage you, when you go to the Museum of Fine Arts, try it and see what happens, see what kind of experience. Uh, put that on your Instagram. See, Jesus has a way of meeting us where we are in our understanding of life and yet inviting us to imagine life completely different. Mark chapter 1 describes the beginning of Jesus' ministry in dramatic fashion. Mark begins by saying the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And just this phrase, the, in the beginning, is an echoing of Genesis chapter 1 where it where we talk about creation, but in other words, it's insinuating that Jesus is doing something new and something big at this, at this juncture. And Mark also begins to utilize this language of urgency, and you find it as you read Mark carefully, you find immediately or at once, this is a high action-packed letter that when you take the time to read that Mark is going quickly through the actions of Jesus. And given the fast pace of Mark, he mentions Jesus' baptism, the, the, the Spirit of God coming upon him, leading him into the wilderness where he's tempted by Satan for 40 days. And then Jesus begins to emerge out of the wilderness, full of the Holy Spirit, full of power and authority, preaching and healing folks and casting out demons from people. And very quickly, he begins to exercise his authority over every realm of life, human hearts, Nature, the supernatural, sin, illness, and afflictions of all kinds, Jesus demonstrates his authority. Now, something that's interesting to note, too, when you read the Gospels, is that every time that Jesus proclaims the good news, very shortly after, signs and wonders follow, and also the prayers of healing and freedom from people. I believe that the Gospel of Jesus Christ paves the way for this kind of stuff to take place. In verse 32 says that, 
that evening after the sunset, people brought to Jesus all the sick and the demon possessed. The whole town, there weren't millions of people, but a whole town, the whole town gathered at the door and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. Just think, just this feeling of your house being invaded wherever Jesus was because people are coming to you because you have something they need, they want. It's an overwhelming feeling. And yet, the text says that Jesus healed many, not all. I think that's interesting for us because I think sometimes we have this idea that Jesus healed every single person he encountered and delivered every person. But that's not the case. I'm gonna just pause right now as you encounter the text here and to say, I don't think that on this side of eternity all of us receive cure, the cure that we're wanting for whatever sickness we're facing. It's part of the brokenness system and world that we live in. It's not God punishing you, it's just the way things play out, and yet sometimes God chooses to intervene and bring about a cure on this side of eternity. But ultimately, we're all healed, made whole in Christ in heaven, in the afterlife. And we have encounters of people who are seeking Jesus for a cure on this side of eternity. So as Jesus is, people are gathering around wherever Jesus is uh, housed up at this point, people who've been bound up to their mattresses for years, the cripples suddenly are standing up and they're walking and the people who are blind can see and the deaf can hear and the captives are set free and those who had been demon possessed are now liberated and the depressed, their countenance changed, they have joy in their life. So suddenly you can begin to see, you know, begin to imagine this little town gathered around this little bitty house where they're beginning to sense that something is happening, something is stirring, hope is building up and there's a lot of celebration in their hearts Lives are being changed because they had an encounter with Jesus. I believe that it's very difficult, darn near impossible for us to have a true encounter with Christ and not be changed in some way. Some of us want to have encounters with Christ and this is sometimes why we come to church as if Christ is not with us when we leave and we wanna have some kind of experience and then live our lives a completely different way. And Christ says, I will enter into your space, whatever that space looks like, in the measure that you allow me to, but I wanna invite you into something different. I wanna invite you into being present differently because I want to live in your life. I want to change you from the inside out. So Mark chapter one continues and, and he says in verse 34, and he also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Now there were things happening in the physical realm, physical healings that were happening, storms had been calmed. Um, People had seen the demon possessed who were going crazy all of a sudden be calm and now they're more civilized and everything else. Something was happening. But at the same time, there is also something happening in the spiritual realm. Now, Jesus doesn't make a distinction between these two realms. Jesus was in the process of revealing himself, his love, his power, his plan for all of humanity. And he says, I have a way of introducing this to the world and demons, you're not part of the plan, so shut up. And that's what he essentially tells the demons. So they're quiet and... The people, as, as you read the story, weren't necessarily seeking Jesus because they loved him so much or because they saw him as the Messiah, the one who was coming to rescue them and restore the kingdom. They were simply coming because this man could do something that I think he could do for me. And they were simply coming to Jesus because they were desperate for something. You know, we just sang a song that Jesus, all I want is you. And I think sometimes I'm sitting there and I'm like, uh, I could use a Frappuccino. Like, I don't necessarily just think, I don't need a Frappuccino, I just want Jesus, or I want something else. But the reality is, these folks weren't coming to Jesus because he was so awesome or because he was forgiving of their sins. He had power. He was healing folks. And these folks were desperate enough to get close to him and see maybe, just maybe, Jesus will do something for me. And Jesus doesn't say, well, you should really seek me for who I am, and this is who I am, and then I'll give you something. He says, I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give freely to you, to your family and everyone else, because ultimately, he came to give of himself. He says, I want you to know me, I want you to follow me, I want you to share me with the entire world, with everyone you come in touch, because I want to change your life. Very few of us actually come to Jesus to change our lives. We want him to change our circumstances, but not really our lives. But he says, you know what, I will change circumstances, but in the process, I want to change you, make you more and more into my image. He says, I wanna work in you, I wanna work through you. That requires a level of desperation, which for me begs the question, are you desperate enough today to do whatever it takes to get before Jesus? 
or are you just waiting for Jesus to show up and do something in your life? See, sometimes we're too comfortable where we are because we have the resources, we have the means, we have the strength, the knowledge, the, the network to remain where we are. There's no sense of desperation because we just go with the flow. When you experience true desperation in your life, it has a way of doing something with you. It puts you laser focused. That means you're willing to risk something. You're willing to do things that don't make sense in the world's eyes, that seem unreasonable, illogical. That's what desperation will lead you to do. Those of you that have experienced desperation in your life as it relates to the life of a loved one or something, you know what I'm talking about. Desperation, sooner or later, will lead you to cry out in some fashion. If and when you are desperate enough, you will cry out to Jesus. Until that day comes, you're gonna continue to do things your way, in your own strength, and think that everything's fine. But I believe when we read scripture, God is looking for a people who are desperate for him. And you're like, well, what does that look like? And I think we begin to unpack this over the next few minutes of what that looks like. Jesus continued to travel the, the region of Galilee, preaching and teaching and casting out demons, beginning to create his, uh, his disciples, this community of his disciples. And the scripture says, then a leper came to him, imploring and kneeling to him, if you will, you can make me clean. And this man with leprosy approaches Jesus, which is unheard of. This dude had the ultimate kind of cooties. Y'all remember when we had uh, that thing, COVID? It was going around, you know, and those of us that when it was first starting, we, we were afraid of, if you maybe had it, like I wasn't gonna hang around you, but you know, we triple masked and we did all this stuff, Ziploc around our arms, we take baths and hand sanitizer, body sanitizers, and then we pour vodka or whiskey, trying to keep every little germ out possible. We did whatever it took because we were concerned for our health. This is what people did in respect to a leper walking around them. They wanted nothing to do with him. And yet, this man understands his situation. Been bound to the situation for a while, and desperation begins to do something within this man. It begins to birth within him a dose of courage that had, he'd never experienced before in his life. See, the Mosaic law prohibited this man from con to being in contact with other people. Yet he approaches Jesus. Hope took a root of his heart and he began to do something he never thought he would actually do. Notice the body language. It says that he was imploring and kneeling. This outward behavior of this man matched his inward state. He was begging Jesus. When was the last time you saw a grown adult begging for something? Can you think of a situation? I hear people pout all the time and throw little pity parties for themselves trying to get the other person to do something, but they're not begging. We're too proud, we're too civilized, we're too educated. But yet you have this man who is now walking, he's in this place, and all of a sudden he does the unthinkable. He approaches Jesus when you're not supposed to be near people, and then he is crying out. He is begging Jesus, would you please heal me? He is kneeling, this posture of submission before Jesus. I believe his head is down, doesn't have the courage to fully look at Jesus, and yet he's standing right there. That speaks to what's inside of his heart I haven't seen an adult cry out like this ever in my life. I've heard of fathers and mothers kneeling on bedsides of their dying children. But to another person, to another adult, what would that look like? See, leprosy described in this section of scripture really covered this whole idea of different diseases and skin diseases. Luke chapter five says that he was covered, talking about the same narrative, in leprosy. A study was done that shows that the body's warning system of pain is destroyed in leprosy. This disease would numb their extremities as well as their ears, eyes, and nose. And the devastation follows would come, um, that follows comes from the incidents as reaching one's hand into the charcoal fire because something fell, they couldn't feel it and they get burned or something is thrown in them and they touch something, they can't feel it, and it causes damage to their body and then there's an infection and ultimately it falls off. Or they grab something, a tool too hard, 
and then suddenly they have a stump-like effect. In third world countries, vermin sometimes chew on sleeping lepers because they can't feel it. A doctor by the name of Dr. Brand writes that after performing corrective surgery on a leper, he would send a cat home with him as normal post-operative procedure. And he describes this disease as a painless hell. The poor man in our story had been unable to feel for years, most likely disfigured from head to toe in some manner, skin rotting, wounds exposed, the stench was repulsive. A leper in this advanced kind of, of condition was very well aware of what everybody else thought. And if for some crazy reason he was able to, to daydream and wish that his life was different, it would be just a matter of time before those around him in proximity would remind him how awful and hideous he was. Verse 45 says, anyone with such, of a, chapter 13 in Leviticus says, anyone with such a defiling disease must wear torn clothes, let their hair be crazy unkept, lower, cover the lower part of their face, and cry out, unclean, unclean, everywhere they went. And as long as they have this disease, they remain unclean, they must live alone. They must live outside the camp. Can you imagine the embarrassment, the humiliation of having to dress a certain way because there's something wrong with you? Could you do it? Could you see yourself going to H-E-B, Town Lake, going to lunch afterwards, because you have to go somewhere to get something? And not only do you have to look like a, like a freak, but you have to yell on top of that out loud, unclean, unclean, coming through. You have to visibly and audibly alert the world of your condition. The smell took care of itself. Could you do it? See, that was the Levitical law. And during Jesus' time, they felt the need to add more stupid laws on top of that. So if a leper would stick his head into a house, then the whole house was deemed unclean. There was a whole process to purify the house. It was against the law to greet someone with leprosy. So now we just have to ignore these people. Lepers had to remain 150 feet away if they were upwind, and six feet if they were downwind. I knew six feet came from somewhere. Under no circumstances were you allowed to touch them. Can't touch this. Can't touch this. It's hammer time. Everywhere he went, this song played. He went, this was his walk-up song. You can't touch this. You can't look at him. You can't even look in his general direction because you might become unclean yourself. So the best thing was to stay away. Let him dance by himself. But I'm gonna go my way. Josephus, a historian, reports that for lepers during this time were treated as dead men. And yet this leper knew what was at stake, knew his condition, and yet he cried out to Jesus even more. He was saying to him, you did it for so many other people. All these people gathered there and you did it for them. Maybe, God, just maybe, you'll do it for me. Maybe that's your, your cry today. That God, I've seen you do it for so many, but maybe you can do it for me. I don't know why you would, but maybe you would. He knew that Jesus had the ability to heal him, but he wasn't sure if Jesus actually would. The scripture says in verse 41 of chapter one, it says, moved with pity, he stretched out his hand, Jesus, and touched him. And he said a powerful word, two words, I will be clean. This word pity gives us insight into the heart of God, into Christ's heart. And he's moved with compassion. It's not just, ooh, bless his heart. That must be tough. It propelled him to some kind of action. Different translations insinuate that this word could also be translated as anger or righteous indignation, signifying to us that, that, 
that God is also ticked off with all the evil and sickness and things that are broken and distorted in this world, and yet he takes action. See, Jesus bucked the boundaries of his day to reveal himself, his power, his love, his grace, and his authority to all mankind. And then Jesus did the unthinkable. He had a conversation with this man. The man got close enough to have a conversation with God. And I wonder, did he actually submit to the Levitical law as he approached Jesus? Did he yell, unclean, unclean, coming through? And as a result, people started to spread apart at least six feet to let this leper through. And Jesus doesn't say, you know what? Maybe you should just move back a little bit. Yeah, definitely 150 feet. The wind's blowing this way. Jesus lets him get that close. Jesus doesn't move. He sees the desperation, he sees the faith. I believe that God sees our faith and he faces it. And they begin to interact. And Jesus listens to him. And then Jesus touches the untouchable. And he does it publicly. He touches the grody old sores, infected wounds. The guy that stinks that no one wants to be around. Jesus is there and he touches him. It wasn't this dinky little touch. It wasn't boop. That's all he needed to do. It's a firm and deliberate touch. I wonder how long had it been since this man had experienced any kind of affection, meaningful affection. See, Jesus' touch represented so many things all at one in one single touch, acceptance, restoration, forgiveness, healing. This is this beautiful image of this desperate man at the feet of Jesus, begging. I imagine tears coming out of his eyes, down his cheek. And that Jesus doesn't reject him. And Jesus intentionally touching him. So tangible in more than one way. And notice Jesus' power and authority over disease. Y'all, for those of us who pray, pray with power, pray with authority. We can speak life and healing into people's lives with our very words. Sometimes we're all caught up in our own heads. Well, God, what if God doesn't show up? That's God's problem. But I'm gonna pray and always side with life. And what if we were that kind of church when we see situations that we seem so desperate and so dire that we're gonna press in and we're gonna point every single person to Jesus and see what he does. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. I think about this image of what this man is feeling. He knows that all of a sudden, this baby's smooth skin, something has happened physically. Again, physical, trying to show us something spiritual is also happening. Just like that, the curse is lifted. Just like that, he's integrated back into society. No longer does he have to walk around telling people, you can't touch this, you can't look this way, I'm unclean. Now he's able to be embraced by his family, get a job, enter back into community. Yes, he has to go have the priest declare him clean. That's a formality at that point. But all of this is possible because Jesus touched him. How long he'd been this way, I don't know. How long did he travel to see Jesus? I have no idea. What I do know is that he made his way before Jesus at whatever cost. And I think we could stop there and say, you know, that's a cool story. And let's pray. I'm like, wow, we got done early, but the story actually continues. Because there's, there's the story on the surface of what actually happened. And then there's the undertow of the story, the undercurrent. And Jesus would always take the visible to teach us about the invisible truths. So whenever there were stories about healing the cripple, or the deaf, or the blind, or the demon possessed, or the leper, it's because it was a mirror to our own human condition. 
It's about us, that our hearts. And yet Jesus crossed and broke just about every ceremonial and cultural norm and law to bring healing and freedom to our very lives. Ultimately, he defeated sin and death on the cross, and he says, it is finished. And everything else that was distorted by sin, he says, I will make it right so that you and I could be in full relationship with him. And here's the thing. Spiritually, I was the guy in the closet. And it wasn't until I realized that I couldn't clean myself, that I couldn't make the stench go away, that I actually got desperate for Jesus. See, but as long as I think I'm okay, as long as you think I got it all together, as long as you think you don't stink, as long as you think you don't have a disease, then you won't experience desperation. And I believe only the desperate will experience the miracle and power of God. And he's looking for desperate people all over. And I don't think desperation means that we're crazy. I don't think desperation necessarily means emotional intensity that we see in this story. It's a, it's, a gray, it's a growing and greater dependency upon God to do everything in our lives. Because sooner or later, that which we depended on, that which we thought had our back, that which we thought had our sex and secured everything for us can be taken out from under us just like that. It, I don't think we have to wait to hit rock bottom, to hit desperation, to actually seek God, to actually be desperate for God. It's a desperation that comes from the Spirit to say, Lord, I need you, and I need you now, and I need you forever. But that realization in my life awakened me to something new and different. Sometimes we get caught up in maintaining all of our facades to let the whole world that, hey, I'm clean, I'm good, I'm good, I'm clean. And the world doesn't care. There's a desperate world crying out. And desperation will cause us to throw our image management out the window and actually throw ourselves at Jesus' feet in an undignified manner. And it'll pose everything that the world says. That's what desperation leads us to do. It opposes the way the world thinks we ought to behave and conduct ourselves and leads us to this place. You know, say, I'm willing to be foolish for Christ. So I ask you this morning, are you desperate for God to do something in your life? If so, how desperate are you? Like, I'm kind of desperate. You're not really desperate. You might be eager. It would be cool. You're hopeful, but you're not desperate. There's perhaps a handful of you that are really desperate that you're at the end of your rope. You said, I need God to show up and do something. And I want you to know God is here and he's looking at you and he says, I will. What does that look like? I don't know. But it's gonna take some courage for you to say, you know what, I'm desperate for him to do something. It may not be, Lord, I love you. And I, it's like, Lord, just do something, please, right now. And that's a beautiful thing. Because God meets us there and he begins to work and reshape our lives. Some of us here understand what it's like to be touched by the master, by our savior, and we've been restored. Thank him for it. In either situation, be prepared when we cry out in desperation because he's gonna ask us to do the unthinkable. Sometimes as individuals and perhaps even as a church for us to go and touch the untouchables of our community. And I'm not referring to any particular agenda or politicizing this. But I'm telling you that as God's people who've been entrusted with life, who've been entrusted with light, that there may be situations where he says, I need you to go. You're like, I have not go. I am with you. Because there are people that are hurting. There are people that are confused. There are people who are in bondage right now. And when we step in there, God begins to bring about freedom and healing at levels we never thought possible. I want to live a life that's desperate for God. I don't always. I get desperate for other things, for perfection, for comfort, for happiness. But am I desperate? for a life that's different, that can only come from God. 
And sometimes it just starts with us saying, Lord, would you do something because I'm at the end of my rope? Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your love. Lord, I, I, I ask that, that in your grace you would draw near to us now. That we wouldn't have to wait till we hit rock bottom. That we would humble ourselves before you in such a way to say, Lord, I am desperate for you now. Maybe this journey of desperation, whether it's something emotional in your life or something financial, physical, and you're saying, Lord, I, I need a breakthrough. I want something different. I don't know what it, even what to ask. Maybe it's for your own kids. You know, if that's you, would you be as bold as to raise your hand where you are? Say, Lord, do something in me, around me. In Jesus' name, raise it high so I can see these hands. You know, there, there's boldness around this room and courage of people crying out to you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would bring about healing, impart wisdom and strength and financial breakthrough and reconciliation where is needed. Do what only you can do, Holy Spirit. We're imploring and kneeling at your feet right now and ask that you would move in this body, your body of brothers and sisters. Others of you have been deemed clean. You've been forgiven. And yet you still walk around dressing and telling the world, unclean, unclean. I want you to be free this morning in Jesus' name. Because Jesus has already dealt with it. He has forgiven you and he is restoring you. And he's inviting you to walk into a new life. So receive that now in Jesus' name. Lord, increase our desperation for you in all that we do and all that we say in Jesus' name. Would you stand as together we declare our desperation for the Lord, our need for him? Grace is found in 
desperation that I spoke about is not about us being crazy people or people without a hope or people without faith. A desperation that leads us to depend on God in everything that we do and say, with all that we are, with all that we have. And I pray that as we leave this place, that that kind of desperation would grow more and more in us a longing for God of what we just sang about would become a greater reality in our lives in all that we say and do. Not just for our sake, but for the sake of this world that's desperate for different reasons. So go in his peace and his love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.